This video is going to be on Lecture Notes 9, which is an introduction to graphs. Now, the reason we study graphs is that a whole host of computational and mathematical problems can best be stated in terms of graphs. And I'm going to give a number of examples of those as the video goes along. But basically, a large class of problems can be represented in terms of graphs, so it's a good idea to have some good intuition about what graphs are. So let's define a graph. A graph is made up of a finite set of vertices, V, and a uh, a set of edges that is some relationship between these vertices that somehow connects these vertices together. So we have two different types of graphs. One is an undirected graph and the other is a directed graph. In an undirected graph, if you think of the edges between two nodes as a bridge between the two nodes, this is a bidirectional bridge. You can go either way on this bridge. You can go from V1 to V2 or V2 to V1. In a directed graph, you have unidirectional bridges or one-way bridges between nodes where you can only go from V1 to V2 but you can't take this same bridge back from V2 to V1. So now we're going to define a few things because we have to get comfortable with the vocabulary of graphs before we can do interesting things with them. So first we're going to define a path. A path is a sequence of edges that you can follow between two nodes. So for example a path between V1 and V5 would be given by the edges uh, so V1 to V5 is the path created by the edge between V1 and V2, uh, followed by the edge between V2 and V3, followed by the edge between V3 and V5. This is a path from V1 to V5 in this undirected graph, and a path from V1 to V5 in this directed graph, uh, in the second one, V1 to V5 would be given by v1, v2, v2, v5. Now more specifically, there's a couple of subtypes of a path that I want to define. One of them is going to be a simple path. And a simple path is a path that has no re repeated vertices on it. With no repeated so you never visit the same uh, vertex twice. So this right here is a simple path. An example of a path that's not simple between V1 and V5 would look something like this, where you have V1 to V2, V2 to V3, V3 to V4, V4 back to V3. See, we've repeated this vertex V and then to V5. So that's something that's not a simple path. Now another definition I want to give is a cycle and a cycle is a path which begins and ends at the same node so a cycle in this graph would be v1 to v2 v2 to the v3 v3 to v4 and v3 v4 back to v1 a cycle in this graph could be v1 to v2, v2 to v5, v5 to v4, v4 to v3, and then back to v1. So that's also a cycle. Now you can uh, define another thing, which from these two you should, uh, you should be able to conjure up yourself, which is a simple cycle, which is a cycle that, go, that has no repeated vertices or something that has no repeated vertices and still uh, manages to start and end at the same node. Now something to notice is that we haven't had any self loops in the graphs that we've drawn. So a self loop would look something like this where you can exit the same node that uh, exit one node and re-enter it along some path. And now there's no nothing against simple loops and there's no reason that we can't have simple loops in a graph, but uh in general, we don't consider simple loops and we'll I'll very specifically tell you when we are considering a, sp a simple uh the possibility of having simple loops. But in general, we don't consider simple loops when we're talking about graphs. Now, the last thing I want to define in regards to graphs is the degree of a, of a, of a node. So a de the degree of some vertex V uh, that's a member of the vertex set V is equal to the number of nodes, sorry, the number of edges adjacent to the to that node. 
So just the number of edges entering, entering and exiting the node. Well, that's just for an undirected graph, actually. So uh, the degree of V1 would be 2, because there's two different edges, this one and this one, that, uh, that enter and exit V1. Now for a directed graph, we have to define degree a little bit differently. We, we actually break it up into two sub-sections uh, of degree. So you have an in-degree and an out-degree of a no vertex V. And the in degree is the number of edges that are entering the node V. The out degree is the number of edges that are exiting the node V. We're going to define a couple other things, but really with the intent to solve a particular class of problem. And that class of problem is similar to the one illustrated in this figure right here, which is the seven bridges of Konigsberg. So imagine that these nodes are uh, four cities. And these seven edges that connect them are seven bridges. Now, uh, what people wanted to know was, is there a way to cross all seven bridges without ever crossing a single bridge twice? Now, the mathematician Euler actually proved that this uh, could not be done. And he used graph theory to do so. And he essentially invented graph theory uh, in doing so. So now we can define an Eulerian path, which is a path that uses each edge exactly once, and it uses every single edge. Note that this is different from a simple path, because a simple path used each vertex uh, at most once. It never repeated a vertex. Now this one is saying that it uses every, the, uh, an Eulerian path is a path which uses every single edge exactly once. So the way I like to think of it is if these are really bridges and these, no these nodes uh, are connected by bridges, uh, what you do is after you cross a bridge, you have to burn down the bridge. And at the end of your path, you should have burned down every single bridge. So if you start at this node, an Eulerian path would be going from this node to this node, taking this bridge and burning it, and burning it after you uh, cross it and then going back here, burning this bridge. Notice that this is no longer a simple path. And then going from here to here and burning this bridge. Now we've completed an Eulerian path. Now we're going to define something else, which is an Eulerian tour. An Eulerian tour is just an Eulerian path that is a cycle. So you use every single. Uh, edge, and you start and end at the same node. So you start in your hometown, uh, go to all the nearby towns, burn down all the bridges that lead from them to anywhere, and still manage to end up back in your own hometown. Now we have the tools in our chest to prove Euler's theorem. And Euler's theorem says that an undirected graph has an Eulerian tour if and only if it is connected and every vertex is of even degree. Now, there's a little caveat to this connectedness. Uh, it doesn't have to be completely connected. Uh, it can be connected except for isolated nodes. Now, isolated nodes are nodes with, uh, no, with no edges connected to them. They're not connected to any other nodes. You don't really have to consider isolated nodes when, cons when trying to figure out if there's an Eulerian tour, because an Eulerian tour just, uh, just concerns using every single edge exactly once and doesn't really care about these isolated nodes. So from here on out, I'm just going to assume that our graph doesn't have any isolated nodes. Let's prove this. We're going to start by proving it in this direction. And that's to say we're going to assume that there is an Eulerian tour in our graph. So if we assume there's an Eulerian tour, we know that every single vertex that has an edge adjacent to it, every single vertex that, that is connected to something by an edge must be visited. So the fact that we visited every single node, the, the fact that we visited every edge 
implies that we visited every non-isolated node. And I said we weren't really going to consider those, but we are here. So the fact that we visited every edge means that every node that has an edge connected to it has to be visited at least once. So this implies that the graph is connected, because except for isolated nodes. So that was part one. Now part two is showing that every vertex is of even degree. So the fact that we went on a tour means that every time we entered a node, we exit it immediately. Uh, so if you have a node here, if you enter it from this edge, you have to exit it immediately uh, to go to another node. So this implies that every single node in between the first and last node has to be of even degree in order for you to get anywhere, right? Because otherwise there wouldn't be an Eulerian tour. You would you would have to get stuck somewhere. Because you would get if if there were an incoming node and there were no way way to go out, i.e., the node had an odd degree, then you would then you wouldn't have an Eulerian tour. So basically, we're left with only the first and last node that uh, can have an odd degree. But this coupled with the fact that the first node is equal to the last node, i.e. they're the same node, uh, this implies that every node has even degree. Because you can match the, uh, the vertex that's exiting uh, your first node. Say this is your first node. Uh, you can match the vertex that's exiting it. It does a whole bunch of things, blah, 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 blah. It gets to this node right here. And then it enters this node. So you can match this one and this one. And you'll see that every single node has to have even degree, including the first slash last node. What's left is to prove it in the other direction. And this one's a bit trickier. So here we're assuming that a graph is connected and of even degree and we want to show that an Eulerian tour does indeed exist. The argument goes something like this. The first part is, so imagine you have some starting node, u is your starting node, right? And then you go along your path, la di da and then you get stuck. So what we're going to claim is that if you are stuck, You must be back at node 2, at node u, sorry. And the argument for this is in the notes. It's a proof by induction. I'm not going to do it out completely, but I'm going to give you some intuition for the argument. Basically, what it's saying is that if we uh, assume that every, every node has even degree, when you leave the node u, you use one vertex to enter that node, there must be another vertex that allows you to exit any given node that's along your, along your walk. So anytime that you're stuck, you must be at a node of odd degree, which none exists, or you must have used up every single bridge that is connected to any given node. And the only way you can do that is if you return back to the node u. Just to reiterate that, suppose that you arrived at some node v dash. In order to have arrived at that node, even if you did some fancy stuff in the middle, like fall, go like this, right? You have to have used one vertex to enter that hasn't been matched by its exiting vertex. As in, you have to have traversed an odd number of nodes in order to have arrived at v dash, or an odd number of the edges connected to v dash in order to have arrived at v dash, because your arrival at v dash is not yet paired with somehow sometime when you left v dash. I hope you're convinced on that point, but if you're not, uh, maybe take a look at the notes and they can clarify things. But we're not actually done yet, and the reason that we're not done is that we cannot be certain that we've traversed all edges when we have arrived back at u. So we know that we've, we're stuck back at u,
but we're not sure if we've traversed every single edge in the graph, so we need to make sure that we're still able to do that. So here I have written an algorithm that's going to make sure that we can. So first, let's suppose that we're stuck at u with some remaining untraversed edges. Now the first step is pick an edge, u dash to v dash, that is untraversed, where u dash is in the current path. Now this must exist because our whole graph is connected. So there must be some u dash in the current path, which is connected to some v dash, and, and that edge uh, ha has to have not been traversed before. Now this whole untraversed subsection of the graph that contains v dash, it might just be the node, uh, the two edges connected to v dash, or it might be some larger untraversed subsection of the graph. Uh, this, m when I say untraversed, I mean edges, not nodes. But basically, this untraversed subsection of the graph uh, containing v dash must still be of even degree and connected, uh, because nothing will have changed that property of the graph. So after taking this step. Uh, u dash to v dash, after burning that bridge and traversing that node, uh, we have to find a path that returns to u dash using each edge only once. So again, the reason that we can do this is that every node that would be, if there are more edges coming out of v dash going into other nodes, they're still going to be of even degree and they're still going to be connected. So somewhere in there, they have to be able to come back to u dash. So if you've understood that, which you may not have understood by now because I don't think I did a very good job of explaining it, so I really, really encourage you to take a look at the notes as, you, as I uh, sort of go along and explain these things. But if you, if you buy these first two parts, then the rest is really easy. You basically just splice this in to the original walk and then repeat until all the original, uh, all the all the edges have been traversed. And the way you splice it into the original walk, uh, to the original walk, and in order to build the tour, is as soon as you got to u dash, instead of continuing to whatever node you went to, go to v dash, do all the stuff that brought you back to u dash, and then take the original walk that you had. And then if you repeat this, you'll eventually get a tour. So now we're going to move on to what I consider to be more interesting stuff. Now, I don't blame you if you didn't understand what I just did above because it wasn't that intelligible, but the rest of this stuff I, uh, I think I should be better able to explain. So let's talk about trees. Trees are a special case of graphs, and I expect that most of you have seen them in some of your courses before, but let's define a tree to be a special type of graph that is connected, acyclic, and the number of edges in the tree is equal to the number of vertices minus 1. So a graph that satisfies these conditions uh, is considered to be a tree. And you know our natural image of a tree uh, satisfies all these conditions. You can, check, you can check for all of these in both of these depictions of a tree I've given. This is how you naturally imagine a tree. This is more computer science e tree. But uh, a cool thing about this is that any two of these three conditions implies the third. So uh, the proof of this, uh, they're all inductive proofs. I encourage you to try to work through in your head or out on paper how pick any two of these properties, assume that a graph has both of them, and prove the third. It's all inductive proofs, it's all straightforward, and it's all something that you definitely should be able to do. So now let's take the lemma that the removal of any edge in a tree results in exactly two trees. So uh, just looking at the example above, uh, let's try to remove any particular node. Let's imagine we remove this node. So now we have this tree here and we have this tree here. Let's imagine that instead we remove this node. Okay, we're going to have a tree here and a tree here. These all still satisfy the conditions of being a tree. And uh, in order to do this proof, let's in particular take uh, these two to be our definition of a tree. 
because it's easiest, most convenient. You could obviously take the take any any two and, and prove this. But when we say tree, it's going to be most convenient for this proof to think of it as something that's connected and acyclic. Okay, so let's prove this. So here I've illustrated some tree, which uh, these two nodes, U and V, are connected. And I claim that if I remove the node, if I remove the edge UV, U and V, the two nodes, will no longer be connected. So let's say that I get rid of that node. Let's say I remove this node. Right? And then suppose that there is actually some other connection between U and V that is not uh, that is not UV. So suppose the graph, there's some other way that you can go from here to here to here to here back to here and then get back to V from that, right? So if you suppose that there is some other way to get between U and V, then given that you didn't delete this node, there's going to be a cycle which leads you to a contradiction because we originally have been told that this graph is connected and acyclic. So this claim can be seen to be true. Now, once you get that this claim is true, we know that U and V are not connected uh, after we've removed this edge UV. And then we can say that everything connected to U still forms some tree. And everything connected to V still forms some tree. But we know for certain that these two are not connected. So that gives you two connected acyclic components. And we know what defines a tree, at least for this, is that they be connected and acyclic. So there we have our proof. Now what's really cool about a tree is I've given you an example of a minimally connected graph. That is a graph that uses the least amount of edges in order to still connect a whole uh, a host of nodes. So uh, suppose that these these teal dots are are all your nodes, right? We've used the minimum amount of edges in order to connect them, and there's really only one path that you can take to get from any one node to any other nodes. If you wanted to get from here to here, you really have only one choice. So you've used the least amount of edges in order to connect a graph. But what we saw earlier is if you remove just one of the nodes, so if this node goes if, sorry, if you remove just one of the edges, so if this edge goes down, suddenly you have a completely lost connection between two portions of the tree. And that's not ideal. So let's try to think of something that's a little bit more robust, and I'm going to give you what's known as a complete graph. And as you might imagine, a complete graph is a maximally connected graph where every single node in the graph is connected to every single other node in the graph. Now, this, you know, is, is a very robust system. If just one cable goes down, like that one, there's still many ways for this node to communicate with this node. So basically, I want to introduce you to a way of sort of evaluating these, uh, these schemes. So the tree is, is cheap to make because uh, assuming that edges equals money, which they, they often do, but it's, it's very easy to break, so it's weak. It's cheap and weak. Uh, and here we have something that's incredibly expensive to make because uh, edges cost to lay down. Even just in drawing them, edges, this took a lot longer to draw than this because edges take time to draw. And, uh, but it's also incredibly robust. Now, a few examples of, of what this, these interconnection might be they could be different networks of all kinds, but the, they could be roads which connect a whole bunch of cities. And uh, highways are expensive to lay down, but you still want to make sure that if one if one road goes down, there's just there's not no connection between two given cities. You still want to have different options, or they can be cabling that you lay down uh, that make sure that some network is up, or it could be in computer architecture, if you're building parallel processors, you want the communication between your processors to both be robust and inexpensive.
So let's quantify how expensive and uh, cheap these operations are. So to build a tree, you're going to need n minus 1 uh, edges, right? Because that's actually the definition of a tree. So this is in a Bergoro with about O of n, where n is the number of nodes, because you need n minus 1 edges given n nodes. So but what, about, uh, what about a complete gra graph, which is maximally connected? Well, you know that uh, every, every node n, so suppose that there are n nodes. Uh, we know that every one of them is going to have uh, n minus 1 connections attached to it, right? Because it's connected to every other node. But then we're actually double counting because we're considering from the perspective of both the node and the one it's connected to. So you get n times n minus 1 over 2, which is equal to O of n squared. So uh, this is these trees are really good, but these complete graphs are really bad. They grow with n squared. Uh, let's try to see if we can find something better. This is where we introduce the notion of a hypercube. A hypercube is a graph that gets you the best of both worlds. But what exactly is a hypercube? So let's start with uh, an actual cube, which is actually a three, the three-dimensional instantiation of a hypercube, right? And let's say, OK, so this is our 3D hypercube. It's just a regular cube. Let's ask, OK, how can we generalize this to other dimensions? Now, it's really difficult to think of a four-dimensional hypercube, so we're going to generalize it to lower dimensions. We're going to say, OK, this right here is a 2D hypercube, and this right here is a one-dimensional hypercube. OK, so what, what's neat about these hypercubes? Well, we'll find that they're a really efficient way of connecting nodes, but how do we generalize this? How can we think of a more general way to say this? So uh, what we're going to do is we'll say, all right, in this one-dimensional hypercube, let's call this first node 1, 0, and second node 1. Here, let's call, let, this, is, uh, this, Q, this square is going to live in our Cartesian plane. So if this is our origin, which is 0, 0, this would be 1, 0, this would be 1, 1, and this would be 0, 1. Uh, our 3D hypercube, now I'm going to drop this, uh, this notation of coordinates. This is, we're just going to do it in terms of strings. This is going to be 0, 0, 0. This is going to be 0. This is going to be, if this is the x-axis, 1, 0, 0. And the rest you can fill in. I filled them in here with, so this node is 1, 1, 0. We have 1, 0, 1. And this is assuming that you are dealing in a what's actually a left-handed uh, Cartesian plane, where this is our x-coordinate, this is our y-coordinate, and going upwards is our z-coordinate. So uh, again, you have 0, 0, 0, just x, 1, 0, 0, just x and z, 1, 0, 1. Now, w another thing that you should notice, this, that this is that there are eight points in this 3D hypercube, and this is actually all possible binary strings of length 3. There's two to the three of them, and it, you, give, you get every combination of the three. So this l brings us to a more precise definition of what exactly a hypercube is. So we have an n-dimensional hypercube is defined to be that the vertices are the set of all binary strings of length n. Uh, basically, if you have a four-dimensional cube, you would have 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, et cetera. Basically, all, all the points in the n-dimensional space that uh, that can be formed with with binary strings, and you only have an edge if uh, the two two vertices u and v differ in exactly one bit position. Let's look back at our hypercubes to make sure that this is true. You see, uh, the in the one dimensional case, you have zero one exactly one bit position has been flipped. Uh, 0, 0 is connected to 0, 1, and 1, 0, but not 1, 1, because to get from 0, 0 to 1, 1, you would have to flip two bit positions. 0, 0, 0 is connected to 1, 0, 0, and 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1, but it's not connected to other things because only one bit position can be flipped. So we see that this is an adequate description for what a hypercube is, and this actually allows us to scale up the notion of a hypercube to higher dimensions. So let's try and use this newfound information to draw a four-dimensional hypercube.
So we know that we're going to want 4 bits in order to do this, but it's that's going to be really difficult to draw. We can't draw in really even in 3 dimensions, let alone in 4 dimensions. So I've drawn these two cubes, and we know we're going to want a fourth bit, so I'm going to call this the 0 subcube, and I'm going to call this the 1 subcube. And in the three-dimensional case, you had three bits, and just assume that every one of these uh, three-bit strings is preceded by a zero in this subcube and preceded by a one in this subcube. And now, in order to get the four-dimensional subcube, all you have to do is connect all the uh, the analog vertices, basically all the vertices that correspond to one another, uh, from this cube to this cube, and you'll have satisfied both of these conditions for hypercube. So if you think about it, this is 0, 0, 0, 0, 4 zeros, and this is 1 followed by 3 zeros. So if you shift one bit, you'll get from here to there. So these should be connected. So basically by connecting all the corresponding vertices between these two cubes, we get a four-dimensional cube. And here I've done that for you, and though it may look ugly, this is actually what a four-dimensional cube would look like. This leads to the following re recursive formulation of an n-dimensional hypercube, which says that an n-dimensional hypercube consists of two copies of the n-1-dimensional hypercube, the 0 subcube and the 1 subcube, with edges between corresponding vertices in the two subcubes. So uh, 0, 0, 0 to 0, 0, 0. So basically, there's an edge between the vert any given vertex in the 0 subcube and the same vertex in the 1 subcube. That's a recursive way of defining an n-dimensional subcube. So let's try to figure out how this, uh, the number of edges grows with the, si with the number of nodes. So we know like, that if n is the dimension of space that we're dealing in, we know that uh, an n-dimensional hypercube is going to have 2 to the n nodes. We know this because of the formulation of a hypercube in terms of binary strings. We also know that each vertex has n edges because you can flip any of the n bits that make up uh, the uh, any given vertex and, and there will definitely be a path between that vertex and any vertex with exactly one flip bit. So that leaves n edges coming out of every node. So the number of total edges is given by n times 2 to the n, which is the number of nodes. But again, we've double counted every single edge, so we have to divide by 2. And we've double counted for the same reasoning as above, uh, because every edge that's leaving some node is entering another node. and you count, but you count them up for when, consider, when considering both nodes. You're saying that each vertex has n edges, but n, one of those n edges is leading to another node, which you're also counting for n edges. So this grows with O of n times 2 to the n over 2. But this n is not actually what we care about. What we care about is capital N, which is the total number of nodes. So we can say n is equal 2 to the n. So now we get a better idea. So this is, this is uh, not what we care about. What we want to know is how does it grow in terms of the number of total nodes, not the dimension of the hypercube we've created. In addition to not being what we care about, this expression of big O is actually wrong as well, because that's not how you formulate uh, orders of growth. But uh, we know that uh, the number of total edges in terms of the number of total nodes right, is going to be uh, n in terms of in terms of capital n is log base 2 of n multiplied by 2 to the n is the number of nodes n and divided by 2 so in terms of big o uh, the number of edges seems to be growing as n log n log n so how have we done in terms of our task of uh, trying to find something that gets the best of both worlds, which is the cost of a tree and the reliability of a complete graph? Well, we know that the, the tree, the cost of a tree is about n, where n is the number of nodes. And here, uh, the cost of a graph was n squared. 
So what we're getting for uh, a hypercube is about is n log n, which is a lot closer to n than it is to n squared. So we're actually doing pretty well uh, on the cost scale. So now what's left to see is how well are we doing on the reliability scale. So now we're going to prove a theorem in regards to how reliable and how difficult it is to break a hypercube. And what this theorem is going to say is that if you have some n-dimensional hypercube, which is made up of the vertexes v uh, with cap n nodes in it, in order to break off a set, uh, some subset s out of these nodes from this n-dimensional hypercube, where, uh, where the size of s is less than or equal to half of the, it's less than or equal to half the number of total nodes in, uh, in the hypercube, then you must cut off at least s edges, the cardinality of s. So if you want to take away uh, some number of nodes uh, which make up some subset s, you have to cut at least that many edges. Now it, we're going to say that if we can prove this, we have a fairly robust system. So, but let, let's keep in mind this at least right here, because it's pretty important. Let's say we have an n-dimensional hypercube, and someone wants to make off with one node. Let's, in order to disconnect one node, what do you need to do? Well, we know that every node is connected to n other nodes, uh, because n bits can be flipped. So in order to disconnect this, no this one node, from the rest of the cube, you're going to have to, you're going to have to cut n cables. You're going to have to get rid of n edges. So here, the at least is pretty important, and this is looking a lot better than the tree, where if you just cut one node, uh, you you've completely disconnected into two different trees. Okay, so let's tackle this proof by induction. Uh, so our base case. We're going to induct on uh, a little n, which is the dimensionality of our hypercube. So if uh, n equals 1, you have a one-dimensional hypercube. Uh, remember what that looks like. We get this guy, 1, 0. In order to cut off some number of nodes, which is less than the total, which is less than half, less than or equal to half the total number of nodes. So really, there's only one option. You can uh, to cut off one node, uh, how many connections do you have to cut? Well, there's only one thing that you have to cut, and, uh, that you can cut, so here we're good. We have satisfied that in order to take one node uh, and cut it off from the hypercube, you have to cu cut off at least uh, one, one edge. So now in our inductive step, we're going to assume that this is true for some n-dimensional hypercube, and we're going to have to show that it still holds true for an n plus 1 dimensional hypercube. So let's take, uh, we have to consider now the recursive definition of a hypercube to get what this n plus 1 would be. And basically what you would get is two different n dimensional hypercubes. Now assume that there's a bunch of connections going through in the middle. This is an n dimensional hypercube and this is another n-dimensional hypercube. And together, if you connect their, their uh, corresponding vertices, you get an n plus 1 dimensional hypercube. So this is the topology that we're going to be dealing with. And now we want to show that in order to make off with, or rather disconnect, some subset of uh, the nodes in this n plus 1 dimensional hypercube, which is less than half of them, uh, you're going to have to cut at least that many edges. So we're going to have to prove this in two different cases. So first I'm going to illustrate case one. And that is, let's say our rogue disconnector of nodes is going to make off with some subset S0 and some subset S1, where S0 is coming from our zero cube and S1 is coming from our one cube. And the case is that both S0 is, our, is less than half of the zero cube, and S1 is less than half of the one cube. Well, in this case, uh, it's, it's fairly straightforward. 
we know that for some n-dimensional hypercube, you're going to have to cut off at least this many edges, uh, s-naught edges, um, plus. So you know that for each of these individually, edges cut equals is is greater than or equal to the cardinality of s naught plus the cardinality of s one, which is the cardinality of s. So in this case, we're good to go. Now the second case is a little bit trickier. So let's assume, without loss of generality, that from the zero cube, you want to take some subset that's greater than half the size of the original hypercube. And uh, that, by the way, necessitates that from the other cube, you're going to have to be taking less than half. Because uh, if you took greater than half from both of them, then you would be uh, violating the, uh, the, the setup of the problem, which says that you have to take less than half of, of the total number of nodes. So how are we going to prove this one? Well, the number of edges we have to cut, uh, we know is at least going to have to be greater than or equal to S1, because S1 still satisfies the uh, inductive hypothesis. So it's going to have to be greater than S1. Another factor in this term comes from the fact that we know that if we get rid of if we're trying to get rid of S0, we at least have to cut out uh, this portion, which is 2 to the n minus S0, because we know there's 2 to the n nodes in here. So we have to cut 2 to the n minus S0 free from S0. And we know that that's going to take at least 2 to the n minus S0 cuts. Now the last term is going to come from the uh, edges which cross over from S0 into uh, the other hypercube that are connected. So what, what we're going to say is that these edges that cross from S0 into uh, the complement of S1 the, are, are, are definitely going to need to be cut. We have to cut these in order to free S0, uh, disentangle it, and, and make off with it. We're not going to need to cut these because we have already gotten rid of S1. Uh, that was this term. So we're not going to worry about these edges. We're, get, we're taking away S1 and S0 together. So these can stay connected. But these edges we're definitely going to have to cut. So because we're computing a lower bound, we can say that the, that the best case scenario is S1 or, uh, edges uh, from S0 are connected to S1. The maximum number edge of edges from S0 are connected to S1. So we're at least going to need to take away uh, S0 minus S1 edges in order to disentangle S0 from this, uh, from this new hypercube. So this will give us all the edges that we can take away. So now if you just add these up, you'll notice that this and this cancel. Uh, and this was a plus right here, by the way. And this and this cancel. And what you're left with is that the edges cut is greater than or equal to 2 to the n. And we know 2 to the n is 2 to the n plus 1 over 2, which verifies uh, our, our, our original claim. So now we can go back up into the reliability spectrum and place hypercube closer towards complete graph than it is towards trees. So we really have gotten the best of both worlds in using hypercube. And hypercubes are actually very practical and very well used in a lot of different areas, uh, a, a number of which I named before. And something cool that you can see about the topology of a hypercube. So imagine this is our hypercube. We now not only know that it's incredibly strong and robust, but we know that it definitely doesn't look anything like this topologically, right? Because here you have an area where you, uh, so again, in this hypercube, there's all kinds of connections going through. And in, in this topology that I've created, there's a whole bunch of connections going through. So in this topology, there's a bottleneck right here where you would have to cut many fewer nodes in order to make off with large portions of, of your hypercube. We know that it doesn't look like this. 
So the hypercube definitely doesn't look like this. And that's really good that we don't have bottlenecks, not only for robustness, but also for the fact that if this was highways, that if one, one highway is incredibly clogged, if there's a whole lot of traffic, uh, that's going to cause a bottleneck on all the other things that you want to happen. Or if it's a processor, if there's a bunch of tasks wa be waiting, if there's a bottleneck, that's something that you definitely don't want. In a hypercube, you've got uh, this great scenario where you have uh, robustness, lack of bottleneck, and it's not that expensive to make. So these are actually really, really practical uh, to use in the real world.